All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone and thank you for attending our monthly College of Natural Sciences webinar. My name is Allison Sherwood. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for the College. And through our Pelina Ao webinar series, we're aiming to reach the broader community and share the world-class research that happens both within the College of Natural Sciences and here on the Manoa campus. Today's presentation features Dr. Veronica Bindi, who is an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the College of Natural Sciences, and who will speak on the fascinating topic of living on the moon. And so during her talk, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat box, and we will get to those at the end of her presentation. You'll also have the opportunity to unmute yourselves and ask questions directly during the Q&A session at the end. And so now I'd like to introduce Dr. Bindi. Dr. Veronica Bindi has been working for more than 15 years on the Alpha Magnetic spectro Spectrometer operating on the International Space Station. Her research focuses on galactic cosmic rays, solar modulation, solar energetic particles, space radiation, and space weather. Dr. Bindi is working with experts from universities in the USA and Europe and research institutes such as NASA and CERN. She was awarded an NSF Career Award in 2015 and is the PI of a long-term grant funded by NASA to provide space radiation measurements for next human missions to the moon and to Mars. In 2020, she received a three-year million dollar grant from NASA to study and forecast space weather. Dr. Bindi organizes yearly international workshops focused on astroparticles, heliophysics, and space radiation with the aim of fostering a deeper understanding of these disciplines. She's published several highly cited papers and proceedings and has given invited talks at international conferences and colloquia. Dr. Bindi was also the guest editor for an issue of Advances in Space Research, and she is co-editor of a book, Introduction to the Physics of Cosmic Rays. In 2019, she worked at NASA headquarters in the Science Mission Directorate with a double assignment, Program Scientist in the Heliophysics Division and Policy Analyst in Science Management and Strategic Team. And since 2020, she has been an American Physi Physical Society Far West Section Executive Committee member. Dr. Bindi mentors postdocs, graduate students, as well as several undergraduate students from UH and other universities in both the US and in Europe. She has been a faculty resident director for the study abroad program at the Lorenzo de Medici Institute in Italy in spring 2016 and will be again in this coming semester, fall 2021. Dr. Bindi is a TED educator and has been a mentor in the QuarkNet program in Hawaii since 2013. Her TED animation has had more than 140,000 views. Dedicated to increasing diversity in STEM fields in 2013, she was featured by the European Institute for Gender Equality uh, for promoting the positive influence of women in breaking gender stereotypes. Dr. Bindi in 2020 was a special assistant to the Vice Chancellor of Research for Diversity and Inclusion at UH Manoa. And now I'd like to hand over the presentation to Dr. Bindi. Okay, Alison, thank you very much for the introduction and I'm really happy to give this talk. Uh, let me see if I can start my presentation. Are you able to see the slides? Just one second. Um, uh, well, I don't want to see myself. Okay, I managed to remove myself from the screen. Okay, here you go. Okay, so today I'm going to speak about uh, living on the moon. So let's start saying that human desires for exploration is what leads to discovery and this is true nowadays but it was true also in the past has always been true and we have to say that in the past we were already watching at the sky um, because uh, they were navigating by the stars so in a different way but again space was playing a major role also in the ancient times and the first one that were to use uh, the stars to navigate were actually Polynesians. And uh, it's believed indeed that before the Polynesian, the Hawaiian island were inhabited. And when they arrived, um, essentially they believed that the brightest stars indicated the position of an island. 
and following the ukulea star, they were able to find our beautiful Hawaii, which is what we call home. So you can see from this picture um, is a world map from 1482. And you can see how the world looked very, very different back then. You can barely recognize, I'm Italian, I can barely recognize where Italy is located. So their vision of our world was extremely, extremely smaller with respect to what we know right now. And so thanks to explorers that they risk their lives to go versus the unknown, and to bring the knowledge to all of us. And here I just mentioned a few of the explorers, but there are many, many more. Now uh, we know the world uh, as it is. So this is just to make a parallel things and to understand that astronauts are the explorers of nowadays. So uh, even at that time, people were questioning why they should go and do uh, such a very complicated um, missions, uh, uh, expensive missions, and also why, I mean, everything they, uh, they think they needed to know was right there. But then we discover much more about our world. And the same will be with the astronauts. So let's see shortly what happened in these years. So, so we have Yuri Gagarin, which was the first man in space. And this happened in April, 1961. So in this case, Russia was the first one to go to space. And then we was followed by the successful Apollo missions to the moon that started in 1969 and followed with several missions up to December, 1972. And during this whole mission, essentially we brought 24 men on the, on the surface of the moon. Since then, um, the goal of uh, the space exploration changed um, we know that there was the International Space Station. It started with the Cold War in 1998, especially to um, make a peace, let's say, between US and Russia. But then it was a wonderful success because it, it showed how different countries can really cooperate and work together for a common goal. And he also showed that from a different perspective and which is space exploration, how is possible to operate in space, to have humans living for a long period of time in space. Indeed on the International Space Station, we have currently, we have constantly since 1998 people on board. So pe people that have been living in space, uh, they've been spending a year or just a bit more than a year as maximum period of time and this for safety reasons. And we had um, people from all over different countries from all over the world have been to the International Space Station. So we are very lucky to have uh, this laboratory, which is so nearby and that allowed all the studies in microgravity in um, lots of things, technologies and things that can be used in our place, but also so in our planet, but also for explorations. Now, something new that recently has born is the private sector. Uh, so far, they were only the major um, Gover governmental uh, agencies, the one that were really participating in the um, in the race to uh, to space. But uh, recently, we have a private sector, and of course, the leader in this uh, sense is SpaceX. That uh, definitely are making a big difference in the space scenario. So, in May 2020. SpaceX was able to launch two NASA astronauts from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and this marked the first manned launch from the U.S. soil since 2011, when the space shuttle essentially was retired. And um, very recently, in April this year, uh, Falcon 9 rocket uh, propelled the Crew Dragon spacecraft um, becoming essentially the first SpaceX becoming the first private company to send astronauts to the International Space Station. So as you see now, space is more a cooperation of um, different countries, but also governmental uh, agencies and the private sector and private industries. 
And also I want to mention since the latest uh, episode that we had, so we are also speaking a lot about space tourism. So Branson at 71 traveled about 50 miles above the Earth's surface of in his Virgin Galactic spacecraft, um, escaping the Earth atmosphere. And uh, he also tried the possibility to perform um, space um, experiment um, with his Virgin Galactic spacecraft. And uh, Bezos um, in July, the world's richest man, he also held to space in his Blue Origin craft on July 20, traveling 62 miles from the Earth's surface. And then, of course, there are other companies that they plan to do hotels or provide similar service to what uh, uh, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin are providing. And so, as you see, nowadays, really, space is changing its face. But uh, if we look so at the present and the future, what we want to do, and especially what NASA wants to do, is um, going back to the moon and going there to stay. And this is what we call it the Artemis missions. So why the name Artemis? Because it's following the name of Apollo, um, but this time, which is uh, Artemis is the sister of Apollo in the Greek mythology. And so we want to send this time women for the first time in space, um, no, not in space, on the surface of the moon, sorry. And um, so NASA was already working in returning the astronauts on the moon by 2028. But two years ago, the White House directed NASA to speed up the plans to 2024 instead. And you can imagine that this is not a, an easy task to do when you have less time than expected. And plus COVID arrived in the meanwhile. So you can imagine the challenge that this is making. But nevertheless, in this decade, the idea is to go back to the moon and to have uh, something uh, that is going to stay. So the Artemis mission is uh, based on three missions. First of all, we want to go to the moon's South Pole why the South Pole? In the South Pole, they find it in 2018 that there is uh, ice. Uh, so it's not like liquid, liquid water, but from the ice, we can really have uh, water coming out of it that you can imagine how important can be for humans to be there. And, um, and also because it's a bit more exposed to the sun because one of the main challenge on the moon are the night, um, uh, in the moon. So uh, essentially during night is extremely, extremely cold. And so in the polar regions is where instead you get exposed more to the sun. So we're going to have three missions, Artemis 1 that should go in space by the end of this year, beginning of next year, where the rocket, the new rocket from NASA called SLS, we launch an uncrewed Orion into the Earth orbit. So Orion is the module where there are the capsule and the module where there are supposed to be the, the astronauts. For the Artemis II, it will be the first crewed flight of SLS and Orion, and we'll send four astronauts to the lunar environment. And this is, uh, is going to be for the first time in more than 50 years and uh, come back. And then is with the Artemis 3 that we are going to have Orion and its crew uh, of four that will once again, once again travel to the moon. And uh, this time with the first woman and the next man to walk in the surface in 2024. So SLS, Orion, Gateway, those are the critical points that we are going to need. SLS is the rocket, Orion is the module and the capsule where the astronaut will be. And uh, Gateway is going to be like a mini International Space Station orbiting around the moon. From there, from the Gateway, we need to get on the surface of the moon. So for the surface of the moon, again, NASA opened um, open this quest to the private sector. Uh, many people participated and um, of course, um, other one like um, um, Dynamics and also like Blue Origin. But at the end, it was a SpaceX, the one that was selected. 
uh, there will be the uh, will be the commercial lunar lander um, that will go to the moon and the moon gateway to the lunar surface. And um, after that, uh, the idea is to have uh, for the years to come an Artemis base camp. So establish a lunar base camp for stay one or two months developing rovers to help astronauts conduct lunar research. So this is the idea, but you can imagine all the challenges of living on the moon. So there are many of them, of course, uh, they start from the lack of oxygen, uh, going to the lack of water, going to how the soil is constituted, how can we make plants over there? So many different types of challenges that I could list and I could go on for the rest of my talk. But today I'm going to focus on one specific one, which is the, the, what I'm working on, um, which is essentially space radiation. So in space, without the protection of our atmosphere, um, we have uh, what is called space radiation. So astronauts need some type of shielding, which can be provided by the spacesuit, but also the different walls of the spacecraft. So you have to imagine that between Apollo 16 and 17 mission, there was a very strong solar event in 72 that would have caused acute radiation sickness. And so no astronauts were in space at that time, uh, likely, but if we plan to have our astronaut for a long period of time, we need to take into consideration these problems. So the effects of radiation in our body are really, really detrimental. Uh, we do not have that many informations. So the, all the information that we have are from the International Space Station, which is, by the way, still a bit inside the uh, Earth, our planet atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Join the meeting. And this is one of the reasons why we need to boost it, our uh, space station from time to time to go again up in the proper, in the proper altitude. And um, so we have those data. The other data are from the nuclear bombs, uh, other data that are from explosion of nuclear reactor or exposures of people to nuclear reactor, which thank God are not that uh, often. So we do not have that many information and most of them so are generated by simulations. So that's why it becomes extremely important to know very well the radiation environment. We know that the effects that they can damage, of, co of course, the cataract, they can damage, uh, provide what we know as a tumor and also uh, provide degeneration of the DNA and so on. So, uh, as we know, space is filled with this radiation. The radiation in, uh, in physics and in astronomy, we call it with a much nicer name, which is cosmic rays. So uh, we love cosmic rays, it's a beautiful name, and we can learn so much about cosmic rays. But in space, let's say that is also something that uh, our astronauts do not like that much. So how do we know that cosmic rays exist? Some of the cosmic rays can be seen by naked eye. And here you have a beautiful example of a, a, an aurora. So the aurora and the polar regions are these cosmic rays particles that get trapped into our planet magnetic field. That's why they go into the polar regions and they generate these beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, colors in the sky that we can see. So this is just the proof of the uh, existence of the cosmic rays. But of course, the more we go out in space, the more we see uh, their presence. So that's why uh, we built it up our instrument, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, AMS, that you see here in this beautiful picture taken from the International Space Station, um, which is measuring this type of information. So AMS is an international collaboration that has 15 countries and 46 institutes. It's sponsored by DOE mainly, but we have a, a great uh, collaboration also with NASA for the science scientific part for the things that I'm working on. 
and also for the infrastructure of the International Space Station. And then we have also many agencies in the world. Uh, the instrument was built in CERN, and this is a picture of myself, very young, already working in this instrument. In the, so what you see here is our attire is related to the fact that it needs to be a clean room because all the dust and all these type of things can generate accumulation of charges in space. And so you don't want to create any problems with your instrument because you can imagine how difficult it can be to, um, to, to change anything that gets broken, right? And uh, is a particle detector, so that's why CERN, CERN, for the people that are not familiar with, is the largest, um, the largest laboratory of high energy physics and uh, where they study essentially the constituent of matter. So, so they have a, a, the largest accelerator called a, a Large Hadron Collider, LHC for short. And they essentially accelerate particles. These particles eat one against the other in, inside the a giant uh, detector that is able to identify all the um, subnuclear particles, let's say. So where better than there to build an a instrument that is supposed to measure particles that comes from space. Uh, AMS, as you can see here, is located in the external RAS of the uh, International Space Station. It is uh, 16 feet time 13 feet time 10 feet. It is uh, 15,000 leaves and it, the power consumption is very, very low uh, as everything that needs to go to space. So it's 2.4 kilowatt. But it's a very big instrument considering that in space normally you have a small, um, it's big challenge. So you cannot really carry big instrument in space. Uh, so our AMS was um, installed on the International Space Station in 2011 uh, before the decommissioning of the Space Shuttle. So it was the last flight of the Space Shuttle. And here, just to give you an idea of the dimension, uh, you can see it together with two astronauts that are working close to it. Um, so since that time, May 2011, we have measured over 160 billion of particles, which is the largest number of particles ever measured in space. And this is because, of, of course, what we call it in as a scientific term, acceptance. So it means how wide and big is your instrument. It definitely makes a difference in space because you want to have larger statistics to be able to identify what is important. So what are cosmic rays? Cosmic rays are charged particles and are composed of the same subatomic particles that make up all the matter that we have in our planet. So I'm speaking about hydrogen that we call it also protons, helium and heavy elements. So 79% of cosmic rays are nuclei of hydrogen and 14% are helium and 7% are all the heavier elements. So the elements essentially that you see in your chemical periodic table. And where they do come from. So in this slide, you see an int on the back. They get accelerated by very powerful accelerators and those are supernovae. So at the end of the, of the life, when you have stars which are 10 times or more the stars of the, the mass of our sun. So our sun is considered in this regard, the small star because it's a, indeed this unit is, is used as a unit of measurement. And so we, we measure the mass of the stars in solar masses. And when you have a star that is 10 times uh, the sun, what happened is that um, the, the star is like a nuclear reactor that keep it alive. And you start to uh, process uh, all the elements till, until you arrive to the heavier elements like the iron. After the iron, uh, the nuclear reactions are no more sustained. So what happens is that essentially the gravity makes collapse the star. The star collapsed and uh, all the matter get exploded. And you can see here beautiful, beautiful pictures that the astronomy 
astronomers really love and study. So all the different colors represent a different um, um, physical phenomena that is occurring at that, uh, that position at that time, shock waves with different energies involved. And uh, essentially the end of a star in the reality is the beginning, is the nursery of new stars and new solar system that get formed after that. So it's, um, it's something sad, but it's also something beautiful and something that brings new life. And here, so those are the progenitors of the particles that we are measuring. And here you see all the elements that we study. And we also see how are the percentage of these elements. So the, the ones that are more abundant are hydrogen and helium and, uh, and iron uh, at the end, uh, but also carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So this gives you an idea of the, what's, what's happening inside the star that generated them. And also gives you an idea of the interstellar medium so the, the, an interplanetary medium. So from the moment where these particles get ejected, they have to, um, they have to travel from the source until our instrument. And so uh, they carry this information, information of the progenitors and also inf information about the uh, transport inside our galaxy. So AMS, we can say that measures the radiation for different chemical species up to iron. And it can also measure the variation in different time intervals, because as I said, we are taking data since 2011. So you can see here how, uh, for example, our variation varies with latitude and longitude. And with the red, this is for protons. With the red, we indicate higher radiation. With the blue, we indicate lowest radiation. And we know why is this way. We, I already said to you that the particles get trapped in the magnetic field of our planet. And so that's why we have more particles in the polar regions rather than in the equatorial region. But we can also see it in a different way. So not only versus latitude and longitude, but we can also look at it over time. So here on the x-axis, you see how it changes from the beginning of the mission, 2011, till sometimes in 2019. And uh, this is the, the, the colored one with many colors is the flux of, uh, so the, the radiation, the radiation environment. And we see low radiation in blue and very high radiation with red. Now, why the radiation environment is not constant over time? What makes it change? What makes it change is the solar activity. So our sun um, essentially has a, has a cycle. Like here, we have a one year cycle with the spring, summer, autumn, winter, the same thing we could say about our sun. So to make it simpler, our sun has an 11 year solar cycle. And every 11 years, we go towards a maximum of the solar activity and a minimum of a solar activity. So we indicated here the solar activity in pink. And as you see from here, when we have the maximum of the solar activity, we have the lowest radiation. Can you imagine why is that? Um, I can tell you, and this is because our sun, when it's very, very active, he essentially um, he has a wind that he generates. So if we could be outside our solar system and we will look from outside our sun, we could see something oblong like what you see when you look at a comet. If you imagine a comet, so this drop shape, because it's moving in certain direction and also because the sun is generated what is called the solar wind. So the more is active, the more you have solar wind that is strong and it doesn't allow the galactic cosmic rays, these particles from outside to enter inside what we call it our heliosphere, which is the region where the sun has an effect and which is where our solar system is located. So when the sun is very active, 
we don't we have a depletion of particles from the outside when the sun instead is very low is very weak which we we might consider as the winter of sun in the sun what we have we have very high radiation here on our planet because the radiation from outside generated by the supernovae can get inside our solar system so essentially we see that the we have a big difference over 450% in the radiation environment from when we are talking about low radiation, so the high solar activity, to when we speak about low solar activity. So if you want to plan a mission to the moon to stay for a long period of time, seeing this plot, you'll certainly decide to go when you have high solar activity, correct? Because it's when you have the lowest of the radiation environment. So the problem with the high solar activity, when the sun is very active, what it generates are what are called solar energetic particles. So all of you, I'm sure, have heard about uh, uh, solar flares, coronal mass ejections. So they are, you have to imagine that our sun is a plasma. So a plasma it can, cannot even, our volcanoes cannot even give us an idea of how it could look like, you know? So you have to imagine that there are these eruptions in the surface of our sun, and sometimes this huge, um, this huge uh, plasma is coming out of the sun. And uh, to give you an idea of the dimension, here in this plot, you can see how is the relative size of Earth with respect to this uh, explosions occurring at the sun. So we are pretty far away from our sun. So the, nothing is happening to us. But in this time, we have solar energetic particles that get injected, that get exploded outside into the interplanetary, uh, into the interplanetary field. So with AMS, so far we have measured 28 very strong solar energetic particles. I have here listed them in the um, in this table and together you can see the date when they occurred and you also can see the the class of the flare very strong flares and uh, the velocity of the coronal mass ejection the coronal mass ejection is this uh, uh, plasma that get ejected outside of the corona that it needs to have a high velocity and then they also need to be um, in the direction of our planet, because if they go in the opposite direction, the, the solar energetic particles are not that strong or so might not even reach us. So here instead with the blue and red dots, I indicate the position of the sun where they normally occur. So with our instrument, we can see that the, um, the most of the events, very energetic events that get to our planets are from the his side of the sun. And this because how the, our planet is turning around our sun. Now, um, here, flux means, uh, uh, so how much is the flux of the radiation for the proton? You can see one event, for example, September 2017, with the black versus rigidity, you can imagine that this is energy. So you can see the background, what you normally would expect for a normal day. And instead with red, I indicate what we see due to the solar energetic particles. So you have additional particles that are coming. And if astronauts are outside the, the spaceship, of course, they, they could have serious damages. So we developed an alert system. This alert system with the green, for example, this is for the day of September uh, that I showed be before 2017, the day of September 11. And here we can see, uh, so this is in 24 hours. So at 1.29 a.m., the situation is a uh, normal condition, as you see, is green. And when you get to 4 a.m., 3.45, 4 a.m., is when you start to have uh, um, solar energetic particles getting into our instrument. And um, you can see that the, this alert lasted till noon. 
afternoon, the things become normal. Sometimes the events last for just a, a day or a few hours, like you see in this case, other times they last for several days. So the important thing is that we need to be aware of this uh, influx of particles. But we can even have the opposite situation where we have a decrease of the radiation. Like in this case, we see for proton and helium, proton is in blue, helium is in red. We see a kind of constant behavior versus the day. Here we have three months window. And in this three months window, we see that at certain moment, and this is related to certain condition happening in the solar wind, we have a, a great depletion of, um, of galactic cosmic rays of radiation. So this is essentially for these 20 days or so is the best time to perform an extravehicular activity. If we want to make a comparison with the weather that we have here, here, when you go out, you check the weather. I mean, in Hawaii, it's way easier, but if you go to the <laughs> to different latitudes uh, before in Italy, for example, where I was living before, but even in Switzerland uh, or other places, so you need to, to watch the weather, the forecast, and decide if you take the umbrella or not. And here is essentially the same. So we can say that when there are uh, solar energetic particles is when you have a storm. Well, in the case of Hawaii, you can think about a new hurricane, yeah? a new hurricane alert. So when we have solar energetic particles coming, this is a hurricane alert. You don't want to go out and do your daily activities around your spaceship that day. While when you have what is called a Farbush decrease, and Farbush is the name given for, from the person that first discovered that can happen these decreases in the radiation environment. So when you see a Farbush decrease, normally they last a few days, but they can last also for months. And so this is the best time, it's the sunny day when you want to go out and you want to do your activities. So of course we can study different, the daily variation for different chemical species. And this of course can improve forecast. So how can astronauts survive for a long period of time in space? The thing is uh, we need to be able to um, have sheltered areas where the astronauts can go. Um, we need to be able to forecast the radiation detection. So be able to tell them when is the time for them to be in these uh, very um, secure uh, areas inside the, the, space, the spacecraft. Uh, we have some shielding that are permanent shielding and some others that are dynamic shielding. Like for example, um, if you have a, a big solar storm coming, uh, you are going to have uh, uh, water and other things that, for example, we have inflatable shielding that where you can move the water that normally you will use for your daily activities or for storage. You can put that in, inside this inflatable shielding and be in this extra protected area for the period of time that you need. So because of that, of course, the better you know with precision when is going to be the hit the, if and when is going to hit the storm and how much, how long is going to last makes your life, the life of our astronaut way easier. And uh, here I just spoke about the astronauts, but I have to say that all the technologies that we have in space that nowadays are part of our everyday life. So if we speak about satellites for mobile communication, GPS, uh, timestamps that are used for every transaction in Wall Street or your credit card, they need a timestamp from the GPS. So all our assets in space of course, to know all this information is better because they can last for a longer period of time. So the study of space weather and its forecast is crucial to extend the lifetime, essentially, of our assets in space and also is crucial for our astronauts. So what we do at, uh, with my research team at the University of Hawaii, 
is focused on the measurement of the radiation environment that supports NASA human space exploration mission. The results that I show it to you, a few examples, I used to improve the models that are employed to predict the radiation dose, which are absorbed by astronauts for both ISS operation, but also for the long duration mission to the moon and Mars. And so uh, what is um, uh, expecting from the future exploration? As I said, we want to be able to build a platform that will orbit around the moon, like the International Space Station is orbiting around our planet. And why this? Because it makes it easier uh, to travel from our planet to the moon. And then from the moon, we can decide if we want to go further to Mars in the future, or if we want to go to the surface of the moon. Then we want to build a base camp on the moon to stay. And why this is important? Because we can learn um, important information how to survive in space. Uh, this is from the space exploration point of view, but then there is the scientific point of view, which is what we kind of care most, which is we want to know uh, from the moon, many informations about our planet. If you if you imagine how much we have learned from the uh, from the Antarctica, um, being able and from the first time we went to Antarctica and just put the flag, and now we have uh, uh, all sort of laboratories and uh, experiments down there that made incredible incredible discoveries about. Uh, uh, about our planet, about the evolution, uh, about so many different things. So the same thing will happen with the moon. And that's why we are super excited to be able to go there and uh, establish something that is uh, a bit more stable. Um, of course, uh, the stimulating the low Earth orbit commercial space economy is something that goes in our advantage because the more uh, a democratic approach of uh, space where it will become more and more fruitful to everyone is something that we definitely want as well because we learn every, every single flight in space, uh, um, there's something to learn about it. And these will develop technologies that are needed for exploration that can be resolved in human health and performance challenges and, uh, and so on. And then of course, it's important also to expand in the US leadership through partnership among NASA, commercial industry and other nations and uh, in this field. And the, the long-term goal, of course, we, we don't have to forget that is uh, also Mars, the, which uh, has been abandoned lately uh, to do something that is more uh, doable in a shorter period of time, but uh, is something where definitely we want to go. Uh, so some final remarks. Um, the discovery requires technical solutions that do not yet exist embracing multidisciplinary aspects. So you've seen how physics, engineering, architecture, agriculture, medicine, all these things, they have to collaborate in a cooperative way. And science is nourished by creativity that is particularly necessary to overcome challenges. So that's why it's important to keep doing these things because often solutions find applications that are completely different from the original purpose and this results in human advancement. And also something that sociologically is very important is that people all over the world are working together to face the challenges of long-term space travel. And this is uh, definitely something that is beautiful about uh, this uh, subject. Last but not least, studying space, you see how much our planet is unique. Uh, it provides life to us and to many other species. And uh, this is a picture I took about the turtle that I saw <laughs> and, uh, here in Hawaii. So we need to protect uh, our planet and our environment. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank Thanks you so much, Dr. Bindi. Really appreciate it. That was an excellent, thought-provoking talk. 
Um, I'd love to open it up for questions now. So anyone who would like to just unmute their microphone, ask a question. Um, I see Andrew Stanton has his hand up. So feel free to unmute and ask your question. Uh, yes, um, thank you for sharing. It was a fascinating talk. Uh, I am a, a UH alumni. I had an undergraduate in physics back in 89. So I do mostly programming these days, uh, but I have a strong interest in um, in composting and using that. I was reading uh, some articles about how that might be done in space. Have you have you done any, or have you uh, been involved in any of that kind of work where um, you need to process some of the waste that's produced? Um, um, no. Quite, quite an issue. It is uh, quite an issue. It's one of the challenges that according to me is, uh, um, very, very important, and that can have also lots of applications in our planet because, I mean, this is something that we all have to deal with, right? Yeah. So I think that in, in space, because of the challenge that we have, that we are facing, which are much more complicated than here on ground, we could really come out with something that is, uh, uh, that could have, uh, yeah, a direct application also in our planet. Uh, unfortunately, it's not my field of expertise. I wish I could be more, uh, yeah, <laughs> I could tell you more about it, but I'm sure you know way more than I do on this thing. So, yeah. Thank you, it was a wonderful talk. Um, looking forward to future events like this. Thank you. Hmm. I had a question about the Forbush decrees. Yes. So you said it's really important to forecast, uh, and I agree. Um, and so I was wondering if uh, you can, or we know how to predict the length of the decree of the dip, um, whether, you know, let's slope, whether it's going to be fast and where it's going to go back up. Is there some information like that that you know? So yeah, essentially, thank you for the question. Um, essentially is what we, let me put it back, the Farbush decrease if I manage to um, oh, share, if I try to share, okay, share. So it's essentially what we try to do. So you're speaking about the Farbush decrease, which is this decrease that you see here. So, is generated when this coronal mass ejection, they come very close to our planet. They um, essentially, they uh, sweep away, they remove all the galactic cosmic rays. It's like, uh, um, imagine something that really clean uh, their road to galactic cosmic rays. And that's why you see this depletion. Now the depletion, the, the start, is always so sharp. So you, and it's um, concurrent with when the, um, these uh, shock waves get uh, into uh, close to our planet. But then the recovery, it, it changes from event to event. So what we are doing with our students, we are trying, we measure it already uh, with AMS, uh, more than 170 different type of Farbosch decreases. We are characterizing them and we are trying to find uh, what is, uh, um, what we can forecast, if we can forecast the Farbush decrease itself and also the, the, how much is the deep, you know, uh, the depletion of the radiation and for how long it lasts. So it's, uh, it's part of a research that we are actually, we are actually doing in these days. Great, thank you. And if I can follow up, is the 450 level, you know, so there's a dip to maybe 400, uh, but if you're in the plateau on the top, is that, um, you still wouldn't go there, you, you know, you wouldn't uh, send the astronauts out? Uh, so ah, no, you five. can still send them out, you can still send them out, but it's a, a normal um, radiation. So you know that you accumulate radiation. You accumulate radiation, so the less you accumulate, the better it is. So the astronaut would have a, 
a dosimeter that tells them how much radiation they are accumulating. And if they get too much of this, of course, they, they, they cannot fly anymore. For example, also now in our astronauts, um, some of them, they cannot go to space anymore because they already had enough of the radiation exposure that they could get. And so when they are here, of course, they can still operate outside, but they are going to be, their time in space is going to be more limited. Thank you. And thank you so much for a wonderful talk too. So inspiring. Veronica, we have a question that came in through the chat from Virginia Hinshaw. She's asking, how and when did you become interested in physics? Oh, <laughs> hi, Virginia. <laughs> So um, I got interested in physics when I was a little kid. Mm, I I'm from Tuscany, from the countryside. And, um, and so the, the, the most beautiful thing was uh, looking at the sky outside and looking at the stars. And I still remember when I was a kid, I was looking at the stars and, and thinking, maybe out there, there is somebody looking at me right now. And we are looking at each other and we don't know. <laughs> and so I, since I was a kid, yes, I developed this uh, passion for space, especially for space. I wanted to become an astronaut and I applied with the Italian Space Agency, but in the Italian Space Agency for what they need to do, you need essentially to be a military. Uh, no, but no astronauts from the Italian Space Agency was not a military and I'm not really a military type of person. So I was like, okay, well, I'll find my way to, um, in a diff to support, you know, the human exploration in a different way. And, um, and then, yes, I studied astronomy uh, at the University of Bologna, which is the oldest university, I believe, perhaps in the world, because it's from 1088. And, um, and I remember I studied astronomy, and then when it was the time to decide for my thesis, I passed in front of an office, and in this office there was the space shuttle, and it was an image of the International Space Station. I didn't know who was inside that office, but I decided to knock at the door, and it ended up to be my advisor. So, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I decided to do the thesis, um, with that advisor on AMS, and uh, and since then, I mean, I still work on AMS. So it was the right door, I have to say. <laughs> I were you influenced by Madame Curie with uh, your work? In oh, of course, <laughs> I love Madame Curie. When you see this picture. Um, where there are all these physicists, the male physicists, and you see her in the front row, the only female, and there you think, oh, wow, that, that woman rock, you know? <laughs> she, she's amazing. She has done things, uh, inc incredible things. Yes. So definitely inspired by Marie Curie. Hello. Yeah, any question oh. um so you said that um yeah like when the sun is active you know it blows out everything um and i was wondering if you can tell the difference if there's any way to know the difference between the for example the, the well the cosmic rays or even the protons that are coming from the cosmic ray uh, that are cosmic ray and the other ones are from the sun or is it all based on the activity the cmes from the sun well, we can definitely see uh, so the galactic cosmic rays, you can see all the different chemical species uh, because the supernovae, they are able to um, accelerate to uh, yeah, relativistic uh, velocities and energies, all those type of particles. The sun is able to, um, at the energies that we are looking at, is able to accelerate only uh, protons and helium at maximum. So first of all, you have this differentiation. And then also um, 
uh, galactic cosmic rays, yes, are uh, the, 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 the one from the sun are um, very much more uh, um, in a shorter period of time, in a very shorter period of time, while the other ones, they are more constantly coming. Um, yes. So then you have uh, the particles from the sun in the solar wind, but those are at lower, definitely lower energies, not relativistic. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And are there cosmic rays that are coming from outside the Milky Way? So there are, actually there are, but for those type of a galactic cosmic of cosmic rays, there are no more galactic. They are called extra galactic because they are coming from outside the galaxy. And because of that, um, they are very energetic. Otherwise they wouldn't make it to here, right? Because they are very energetic. And so uh, because they are very energetic, you need, um big big instruments big instruments and you also need a long time because um, i didn't show to you but essentially uh, the flux of, of cosmic rays decreases with the energies so the more you go at higher energies the less flux of particles you have which makes sense because there are less objects in space that can accelerate up to these energies right so you are ex kind of expecting that. Now, because they are so rare and so high energetic, you cannot build so far something that goes to space because really you will need something that stay for a very long time just to get a few measurements. And also you will need something very extended. So for this type of measurements, we have instruments on ground at the ground level, because for those type of events, the atmosphere, while for the galactic cosmic rays, we need to go up there because they have energies that when they enter the atmosphere, they do like a ball when you play pool, the white ball that crashes all the, the other ones, right? You are at the end, at the bottom. So you're going to see that when arrive a proton from a galactic cosmic rays, hit the, the atmosphere. And so it gets absorbed by the nitrogen and oxygen into the atmosphere and it generates a showers of particles. The shower of particles, they have nothing to do apart from their energies and how many, they have nothing to do with the original particles. So you lose track of the original particles, but you have all this shower. Now, the, the very energetic uh, cosmic rays, they are able to generate a big shower, big showers of particles because they go very fast. They're very strong, very energetic. And those showers, they can me get measured in, uh, in cosmic rays detectors. So for example, one of them is Pierre Auger. Uh, they measure, they have um, a lot of detectors extended in the Pampa in Argentina for kilometers and kilometers, and they measure the showers coming from the original particle. So it's a different type of study. Um, we measure the original particle, but we need to limit the energy. They study the shower generated by the original particle, but they can go at higher energies. And for the higher energies, what they try to do they try to trace back the particle and try to see which one was the original, where is located the original object. So then they call the astronomers and they say, oh, do you see an active galactic nuclei in that direction, in that location? Because I just got the cosmic ray coming from there. So it's, a, it's fascinating, but it's something different. Let's put it this way. For astronauts that are so rare, events that is not something that they are concerned about. <laughs> Maybe we can put one of those uh, Pampa Argentina back in uh, the moon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed the moon could be a fantastic place to have a lots of lots of instrument, especially in the dark side of the moon, when you don't have any 
electromagnetic interference from our planet, imagine how quiet is the backside of the moon. So if we could go there and watch the sky, how many new things we could learn, right? Thank you for such an extensive and awesome explanation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe I have one last question I've been dying to ask you because I know you run a really fascinating study abroad program that combines physics and the arts. And I'm wondering if you could just in a couple sentences tell us more about that program. Oh, yes. Oh, I love that course. I love that course and I would love to do it also here at UH Manoa. The only reason why I don't do it here is that so far they've been told me, oh yeah, if you want to do this in addition to your... <laughs> to your current courses, you're welcome to do it. And I'm like, okay, maybe in the future then, let's wait a bit. So physics in the arts and um, arts and science, I got fascinated about it because uh, I love arts, right? When you grow up in Italy, uh, you are used to work in an open air museum. So wherever you look, you have uh, some artistic uh, um, piece of art. And so I decided there are so many connections between these two. At the beginning, you only think about Leonardo da Vinci is the easiest one. Oh, he was a scientist and he was also a, um, yeah, a painter, an artist, of course. But then you come out with so many different things and you see how much science and arts are correlated and how they influence each other. Um, I give you an example uh, before we mentioned Marie Curie. So Marie Curie, at the time of Marie Curie is the time where we discover in science the X-rays. We start to do X-rays and we start to see that the humans that we see are not really like these, are uh, skeleton, right? A skeleton. And at the same time, there is Einstein with all the studies of relativities and so on. If you look in art, it's the time where we start with Picasso. So it's the time where we leave behind what was done before, what reality needs to look like reality. And we just start to look like Picasso. We put a, a feet and the head and we start to, you know, to do um, innovative things. The same thing is, for example, with the um, optic studies from Newton. Newton, he did all these studies with optics, with the telescopes. Uh, well, Galileo he started with the telescopes, but then Newton, he came out with his book about all the optics. Uh, with the, he was studying also the uh, rainbows, making in a prism and all these type of things. And at the same time in ours is when there are the um, chiaroscuro, the technique of chiaroscuro, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with, I, I show to my students, is when you see the light coming into the room. This is a uh, very true, uh, we have here um, uh, Locke, Locke, and I'm sure you know in the Netherlands, all the painters from the Netherlands are very, uh, famous to use this technique with the lights coming from the window. And so there are lots of interconnections. And also if we think about Michelangelo, so Michelangelo is started doing uh, drawing for doctors because at that time they didn't have uh, all the machines we have nowadays. So they needed to call artists and those artists needed to make drawing that they were perfect. Um, so that uh, doctors could learn from them. And Michelangelo started that way. And indeed in Bologna, I don't know if you will ever go to Italy, and uh, in Bologna, there is a room, which to me is uh, very, very fascinating, is a room where they were doing in the medical school. So the medical school at that time was with the table in the middle of the room where they were vivisectioning who knows what, human bodies, I don't know, whatever. And then there were all the classroom, all the students around, and there was a special locations 
where the artists were to take all the notes and all the, all the design and the drawings. And so it's fascinating how to see at that time how art and science were so related. And, uh, and that's why Michelangelo then he becomes such a famous artist that is able to, with his David, uh, he did a fantastic job uh, with, uh, yeah. And uh, Sistine Chapel, of course, he did a fantastic job in reproducing, um, yeah, in an artistic way, the human body. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to see those connections too between these different disciplines. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, I could go on for days on this topic. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> when you notice them, you are amazed by the, the connections and then... Absolutely. Are there any final questions for Dr. Bindi? Okay, well, I think at this point we will end our Q&A session. I'd like to extend a final thank you to Dr. Bindi for her excellent webinar presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you all for attending as well. It was great to see so many people here. I'd also like to thank the UH Foundation for all their assistance with their development and the production of our webinar series. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you all soon. Our next event is going to be held on September 1st, and it's going to feature Dr. Michael Liu from the Institute for Astronomy from UH Manoa. So please watch your inboxes for your invitation to this event. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and we hope to see you soon. Aloha. Bye.